I want to say that, that you all this stuff. I am, I am uh, excited about you know, what we're, we're doing in the morning. I think that that's pretty significant. Let's do this. Zoroaster, you've heard his name before, uh, a Persian prince of, uh, well, Persia, and what you know today as the nation of Iran. And, and, and he coined a, a phrase, if you would, or a concept, I think, that you know, the religion that you follow, Jewish or Christian religion, picked up on, and that is the concept of light versus darkness. Okay, that concept was never ever uh, considered in a religious or spiritual sense until the advent of Zoroaster of Iran. Okay, and it became a spiritually religious way of defining moral behavior. Light, the good part, darkness, the bad part. Okay, and um, it also became a mainstay of the Jewish and Christian religions of, you know, which you're part of probably one or the other, and it's uh, dramatized in uh, the book of Isaiah, and if you have one of those little Bibles in your hand, you go to page 582, and you take a look at it, you'll see a statement by the prophet Isaiah, in, in which he says, um, in Isaiah chapter 5, and verse 20, okay, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, and he says this, but woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So there's two distinct paths which are developed. You have this path here and you have this path here. You have a path of what they call light. You have a path of what they call darkness. There's a choice. So you've got a choice. You can take either one of these. Okay? Depends on the path. There was a song that Bob Dylan had. Bob Dylan had an album out one time called Slow Train Coming. And one of the songs says, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. Now, along comes a guy who is a very famous and contemporary, uh, well, I'd say common or uh, present-day psychoanalyst, although he died a few years ago. And his name is Carl Jung, pronounced J-U-N-G, he's from Switzerland. And Carl Jung comes up with the idea that this light is the God side of God. And this darkness would be the, quote, devil side of God. That, that, that's a radical thought. And, you know, I mean, what we're saying and what Carl Jung introduced in this light versus darkness is that what we consider light is the God side of God, but what we consider darkness is if you want to call it the devil or the evil side of God. Not, see? So then let's take the word and pr this is the good side of God. This is the evil side of God. And that, that, that presents a whole different kind of ball game saying that they're both the same source. They both come from the same source. Well, once again, we have a scripture that is not read too often in, in religious circles, in Christian circles, or, you know, I, I've never, in fact, all the years that I went to Christian, Catholic, or Protestant churches, I never really heard it, but the Bible, as it does, supports Carl Jung in this approach, and you can see that on page 609, and it's in Isaiah, and it's in chapter 45, and in verse 7, now this is the statement that is made by quote-unquote God, whoever it is, he is, she is, or whatever what is. And it says in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, I form the light, and I create the darkness. I make peace, and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Oh, wow, wait a minute. So then we, we have a statement made by a psychoanalyst, not a preacher or a priest or an evangelist, that God is both good and evil. And it's not only su supported, it's dramatized by one of the great prophets of the Bible, Isaiah, who says that's right. God creates light, God creates darkness, God creates good, God creates evil, and then he quotes God, I the Lord do all of these things. You see the same thing in another ancient part of religion, which is called Tao. Taoism, spelled T-A-O. And it's Chinese. And it looks something like this. Okay. 
one side is black, the other side is white. Okay? And it's called yin yang. Okay? And there's a very interesting and beautiful picture of a yin yang symbol which dramatizes what Carl Jung was saying. They embrace. These two embrace one another. They flow into one another, okay? Light and darkness, good and evil, are linked together by their very nature. And that's dramatized in the Chinese Tao of yin yang, light, darkness, good and evil. And in the Bible it says, I've created both of them. I am both of them. And so they're embraced as one. See, they're, all, they're both part of the same circle. It's not yang over here and you know, they're together. Together. So there are many statements that are made uh, about beauty being in the eye of the beholder. In the same way, what is light to one person or group may be something totally different. Joseph Campbell made a very brilliant statement about this. And this is the, the statement, and I'd like you, if you have a piece of paper, you ought to write this one down, because this is so true and so correctly evaluated by Joseph Campbell. Anyone unable to understand a god sees it as a devil. Okay? Anyone unable to understand a god sees it as a devil. Okay? And that's exactly what occurs. You have people who are in religious circles, you have people who follow religious premises, and yet if they don't understand the religious movement of another person, it immediately becomes something of the devil. And that's what Campbell says. If they don't understand it, it's a devil. Okay? So the mystics understand in a different way, kind of uh, consistent with what is, what is taught by the ancients, kind of consistent with what we've been talking about. The Mystics consider that which is the devil, or if you want, evil, not as something far away, not as something as an entity outside of us, but as a necessary energy that flows inside of us from a higher authority. In other words, this that flows inside of us is just as important as this which flows inside of us, and they both interact and flow in, a, in an endless pattern. The Sufi poet Rumi, who is a Muslim Sufi, made the final the statement, if you have not seen the devil, take a look at yourself. Very good statement, you see. And, and, and when you look at your life, we have people who resent what, the, what, is, what is said here. They can't deal with what is said here. And yet their lives are terror. Their lives are torment. And they are tormented by the same system. The same religious system, the same governmental system that holds down the poor, that oppresses the poor, and yet sells them a bill of goods about religion if they give 10% of their money and all of this kind of stuff. And, and that same, same system ingrains itself so deeply into the minds of people that they can't conceivably even question it. And yet their lives are misery. Poor people, oppressed people, hurt people, and they're poor, they're oppressed, and they're hurt because of the systems of the world of which religion is a part. Religion in the United States is a capitalistic, communistic dictatorship that does not allow anybody to question it, that sticks its hands in the pockets of people, sticks its hands in the pockets of the poor, and dares not allow them to speak a word. And, of course, governments are, are very similar in their approach to, to people. So then, here we have the P Sufi poet Rumi saying, if you have not seen the devil, take a good look at yourself. And then Jesus, Jeheshua the Christ, Jeheshua the Christ comes along in Luke 17, 21 and says, the kingdom of God is within you. Even that statement of Jeheshua the Christ scares the pants off of Christians. They can't deal with it. The kingdom of God, they would prefer to say, no, there is evil. Have you ever noticed, and it's a very strange thing, that in Christianity, and I, and I think it is a very interesting thing. But if you've ever noticed this, and it is strange, in Christianity, 
It is more acceptable to believe that there are evil and demonic spirits inside of the mind than to believe that God is inside of the mind. I received a letter from a man who's a born-again Christian, and it came in, I forget where exactly he lives, but he said, you're wrong in saying that God dwells inside of us. He couldn't tolerate that. But he had no problem with the belief that there's devils inside of us. Because, and the reason is, that the uh, teachings of, of, of religion and Christianity and, and, and many of the religions are extremely negative and they're extremely negative about you and about me. Extremely negative. So religion paints pictures of devils and demons. And what are devils and demons? And if you want to say there are such things, sure. But let's get away from the symbolic characteristic and name of dev devils and demons and just say that they are electrical patterns in the brain. They're electrical patterns in the brain, and sometimes they short, and they misfire, and it can become a demon. So if you want to call electrical patterns demons, fine, I agree with you. But don't try to tell me that this is something outside that lurks behind bushes and all of this nonsense and comes down from another osmosis somewhere. When you, you, know, you know why they call them demons? Because religion and Christianity is a dark ages mentality and they've never grown up or explored anything scientific beyond what they knew back in the 1400s. That's where they're at. They're at to this day. All they know is demons and de they don't have any idea that there is electrical circuitries in the brain and it causes people to behave in a problematical way. Right. There was um, Scott Peck, who's a noted author and doctor, said he investigated, I don't know whether it was 10,000 cases of demon possession, and every single one of them was an electrical short circuit in the brain. Every single one of them was a person who had a psychological problem. But Christianity and religion cannot deal with psychological problems because they've never learned about that. All they've ever learned about is devils and demons. There is no such thing. There's electrical circuitry. When it goes short, when something short circuits, it's the same thing as can happen in this building. It's the same thing that can happen in your car or anyplace else. When something shorts out, it doesn't work properly. And when your brain shorts out, it doesn't work properly. You, do, you can do strange things when you have something going wrong inside of you. And so what do the doctors do nowadays in order to combat the devils and demons? They give you Valium. It's like I used to say that... Um, they used to say that... Um, what am I looking for? This uh, venereal disease was of the devil. That, that was a, the, the God was a plague against people for having sex. And then they found out that the work of the devil could be overcome by penicillin. God. So that was the end of that. It wasn't of the devil anymore. Same thing. So now they're on AIDS. AIDS is punishment from God. Someday, somewhere, somebody will find a cure from AIDS, and then they'll go on to something else. So, because they can't deal with anything scientific because they've never been allowed to think. The people actually believe that Adam and Eve were there 6,000 years ago, because they've never been allowed to think. They don't know anything else. So, that's the picture we have. What Carl Jung does is he takes this devil, demon, and hell thing, and he changes it, and he refers to it as shadow self. Shadow self. And that's how Carl Jung refers to that part of us, which, you know, we sometimes have difficulty dealing with. It, it is, according to Carl Jung, an extremely important part of our being, a part that you could not live without and you wouldn't want to live without. Very, very important. In the same way that there is a negative and a positive that make up the electric that gives you light without the negative you couldn't have the light. You have to have the positive and the negative. Very, very important. In many instances, we talk of our own desires, we talk of our passions, we talk of our secret lives. We come together in meditation, and then some people think, well, I will rise to perfection and all is well. But Carl Jung says the problem with this is you have not integrated the shadow person into this process. And by not integrating the shadow person into the process that by the time you're done meditating, nothing's changed. Everything is the same. Because you're, you're trying to run away from this, which is nothing more than a part of your existence. You know, it's a part of, it's a part of your life. It's, it, it was created, that, don't you see, when God in the Bible and Isaiah says, I create good and I create evil, you have to understand that the shadow part was created. You were intentionally made this way. It wasn't an accident. 
There was not two people running around talking to a snake and eating a piece of pie or something up in some God. For, this, is a, this is something that was created ex explicitly for you to have. You needed a shadow part. And you've got it. See, where you have God, you have Jehoshua the Christ, you have two entities in the Bible that are totally purged of darkness. So what we try to do, we try to touch them in pure light by living up to standards that we can't handle. So what do you do? Obviously. Oh, they say, you can't live up to Jehoshua's standards. You can't live up to God's standards. So what do you have to do? You have to depend on them to save you. Because you're worthless. There's no way you can save yourself. So you're meaningless. So you spend your whole life looking for this hero to save you. I read, uh, we, we have a, a quote, I've got to put it up on the board of a, of a uh, guru who said, don't follow the hero, follow what he was seeking. Mm -hmm. Seek after the same thing that he was seeking, don't seek after him. That's what Jehoshua the Christ tried to get through to us. He says, I don't seek the praises of men in the Bible. You know what Jehoshua the Christ said in the Bible when people asked him to settle their problems? He says, who made me judge and decider over you? But they do it all the time. They're, oh, Jesus, do this. Hey, it's not my problem. It's your problem. He had enough problems of his own. <laughs> you know, if you looked at life and you judged on life standards, the man was a complete and utter total failure. So he had his problems. The people came and prayed to him, oh, Jesus, Jehoshua, please do this for me. What should I do? And he says, who made me judge and divider over your problems? You take care of your own problems. I got my own problems. You can do deal with yours. But they've never been able to deal with that. Because they can't deal with the fact of the shadow self, because they don't understand the shadow self. And the reason they don't understand the shadow self, for most part, religion teaches is that psychiatry is evil. So a guy like Carl Jung, they wouldn't even consider him. But, so what do they do? If you need a counselor, if you need somebody that you go and you see the pastor, who, you know, can be an absolute monkey, and, and he's telling you what to do. Go back and submit yourself to the lunatic you're living with, because it's God's plan for your life that you should die tonight, go home. <laughs> oh. Let's see what's going on up there. So we try to suppress the darkness, but here's the problem that Carl Jung said, and I think I've, I've heard this uh, said you know, in, 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 in other circles here. The more you try to suppress, the more the shadow leads its own life, okay? And then, before you know it, you're in serious trouble. Because you have not tried to allow this to equate with you. You've tried to suppress it. You've tried to suppress it. And it becomes a problem, okay? So, what do we do? And the important thing of what we do and what we have to do is we have to to listen to Jehoshua, who is the Christ. And now this is what he says. And, 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 and you really have to look at the, the Bible and, and take a look at his words in order to see what he's saying, okay? And this is what he says, and it's very important for you to see it. Matthew chapter 5 on page 781. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. He says, be therefore perfect even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Well, we know from Jesus or Jehoshua's teachings that the Father in heaven is that impulse inside of us because the kingdom of God is in us, and so that which is perfection is within us. The Father is within us, heaven is within us, perfection is within us. So it's not a suppression of the darkness as a shadow. This is an integration. This is a wholeness. All of us, warts and all, we are to integrate this. In other words, you can't, look, here is the shadow self, here is the divine self, okay? It's all you, and it's all me. You can't eliminate that. You can't just say, I am going to take this. This is where religion makes a very, very serious problem. They take this part, we're going to get to know God, but they ignore this part. This will just go away. Well, it won't go away. It never goes away. See? It never goes away. It's always there. And in many instances where you have people who are religious people and they find this torment in their lives, what they have to wind up doing in order to deal with the shadow self is go see a psychiatrist and get medicine. 
That's fine. You need a profession. But you, the point is, you cannot become religious or become born again and think that that's going to go away. It isn't, because that's what religion teaches you. If you claim Jesus or Jehoshua as your personal Savior, this will go away. So you do it, and guess what? It doesn't go away. It can't go away, because it's put there. It's part of you. That's like saying, if you, if you confess Jesus as your Savior, your blue eyes are going to turn green. No, they're not. They're going to stay blue. So how, and what, why do you want to take that which is a part of you and get rid of it? Isn't it better to integrate it into your life and find out what's its purpose? Why are we created with that shadow self, if you want to call it? Yes, no, all right, come on, you have to. Did, did you say that you go and you take medicine to do this? No, I, I didn't say that you take medicine to do this at all. Okay. What I said is there are people who are in religious circles who have emotional problems, and in, though they're encouraged by religion that everything will be okay if they claim Jesus as Savior, they find out because there is no knowledge of it, they have to wind up going to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist may have to give them medicine in order to deal with their mental problems. Okay. Because okay. the shadow self okay. is a part of them. They don't, yeah. who, they're, stop, you have to have a professional to deal with it. Mm -hmm. okay. Because they know nothing about it, especially, I mean, you know, where you might have to refer somebody to a professional, to a physician, when there's a need for medication or whatever it may be. The point being, you cannot pray this thing away. No, you know? And, it, I mean, it, no matter, you know, <laughs> there may be a way to, to integrate the energy into your life and to take this energy which is maybe destructive and make it constructive, but that energy is still going to be there. And you always have to understand that the shadow self is just a normal part of us. And how do you live with it? How do you deal with it? How do you remove yourself from the guilt? But see, the problem with religion is to have this self, you become guilty that you have it, not realizing that it was created by God. The Bible says, I create good, I create evil. I create the shadow, I create the divine. And they're in you. And so it's made by God. So what's there to be ashamed of? So understand what I said and understand it clearly. I'm not saying that you can take medicine to get rid of it. I'm saying that there are many people in religious circles, including some of the counselors who are, who are ministers and priests and evangelists, who will have to go see a psychiatrist because they can't deal with this. And the psychiatrist may have to prescribe medicine in order to do whatever has to be done. And I said, that's fine if that's the case, if that's what has to happen, okay? So when Jehoshua talks about being perfect, he doesn't say you can rub that away. Now, how, but we have to be able to prove that. What is he saying? How does he put this uh, condition? How does he sum up this condition? How does he describe this condition of the shadow self and the divine self and saying perfection? Look what he says on page 781. I think you were there a minute ago. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. Jehoshua may say that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. That's is inside of you. Now look what he says, and this is very, very important. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So what he simply says is all normal. You're trying to get rid of something that you were created to understand and allow to integrate into yourself so you can deal. And that's why people can't deal with problems because they're trying to get rid of the very basis of their own identity and they're trying to become... And so what do you say? Instead of directing yourself to be attentive to yourself and to the shadow self and the divine self, what do you say? I accepted Jesus so I'm saved. No, you're not. Very, very critically in deep trouble because the shadow self now is being repressed, suppressed, and ignored, and it's going to cause you, excuse the expression, a hell of a lot of trouble. And, and, and that doesn't come from, it comes from a man of the eminent qualifications, I think, of a Carl Jung, but I think you can get that from most psychoanalysts or most psychologists. Or most, you have to pay attention to yourself. And you have to acknowledge yourself and understand how your mind and brain works. You see? And so... But you notice what he said, Jehoshua the Christ just made a statement. He not only said that he sends the sun, he says he sends rain. Well, there's problems too. Now, there's not some man up there sending rain. There's not some man somewhere saying, I'm going to screw this one up or I'm going to screw that one up and I'll do this one a good one and do that one a bad one. That's nonsense. This is a symbolic way of talking about it. This is nature. Nature runs its course and there's good days and there's bad days. We have a song that we sing sometimes on Sunday mornings. It's a country song. John Denver does it and he says, some days are diamonds and some days are stones and that's the way it is. But you can't say, well, I'm going to accept Jesus and I won't have any more stones. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. So in other words, what we're learning tonight is that the 
Darkness is as much a God part of you as the light. And you're not wrong, or you're not guilty, or you're not, because you have a shadow self, because you're created to have a shadow self. And, and basically, that's why the Apostle Paul said you're saved by grace and not works. And the reason is because there's nothing you can do. And there's nothing I can do. There's nothing that we should do. What happens is happen, just happens that the most important thing that we have in this particular church that I don't think any other church has is the ability to discuss things. Whatever it is. Whether it's masturbation or lesbianism or homosexuality or violence or uh, abortion, whatever. We can, we can discuss anything. And that's great because you can just discuss the dark side, the shadow side, as well as the divine side. But you go in most of these places and this thing doesn't exist. You're not allowed to talk about it. The problem with now, where did it go? Oh, it's just that I can't see it anymore. But where is it? It's suppressed. And that's where it does its damage. That's the story of in Matthew 8 where Jesus, Jehoshua the Christ, goes into the graveyard and the demons come out of the tombs. What's saying is those things that are suppressed and are lingering in the subconscious cause you all kinds of problems. You bring them into the light, you're willing to sit down and talk about it, you're not afraid to talk about it, nobody's going to laugh at you because you saw this or saw that, whatever it is, if you're able to talk and express yourself, if you're able to in meditation bring these things out into the light, then you can deal with them. You can deal with whatever it is that you can see. But you can't deal with it when it's hiding. See? Because, and this is something that Carl Jung says, and you've got to remember, your shadow is your shadow. And it's God created, and you are embraced just the way you are. Light and shadow. And you cannot force your shadow away, and you should not try to force your shadow away. You should learn what it is, and how to deal with it, and how to live with it, and how to integrate it into yourself. And you turn on the television, all you got to do is turn on the television, and if it's not one, it's the other. Everybody's shadow or everybody's dark side is paraded in front of you, all over the place. That's all you see. And if it's not true in the news, they construct a drama about it. And everything that you see is because of somebody's shadow, the dark side of somebody's personality. Because the shadow is extremely complex. And this is something that I think Jung said, you know, when, we, when you try to get into religion, they say, all right, bow your head, say after me, I confess Jesus. Okay, raise your hand now. All right, now everybody that comes forward will sign a card, and you're saved. Jeez, you've taken, the, you've taken the complexities of the human mind and reduced it down to absolute insanity, and we're all standing up, and then we're going to hold hands and sing a song, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, and, and, and we're all walking out of the place convinced that everything is taken care of and have no idea of the complexities that are going on inside of the mind until you get home. And once the, the, the service is over and the evangelist is counting his money, you open the door into your dark little little apartment and then you're back into hell again and you left it all in that building with all of your emotionalism. And that's all it is, emotionalism. What Carl Jung said is understand something. This thing called darkness is not on one side of you. It's not over here. And on the other side of you is peace and light. Carl Jung says, no, it's all over the place, all over the place, every bit of it, and it, and it, and it circulates in a web, it is complex forces which we try to repress, and as we're trying to repress, it's spinning in all different directions all over our bodies and all over our minds, so it's difficult. And why then this makes it so difficult to follow somebody else's meditational technique. Here's the, let's say this is the circuitry of your mind and the darkness patterns in your mind. And somebody says, uh, this is what I do in order to meditate. But their circuitry is completely different than your circuitry. What do you do? You know, it's like sometimes if you take... Uh, when I was, when we were started doing, we got letters from people in England, and they said, send us your videotape. And I sent them the videotape, and they put it in a VCR. Didn't work. 
because their electrical patterns are different in England than they are here. So they have different kind of VCRs. So the tapes have to be changed here. They won't work. And so it's the same way. If somebody gives you a meditational technique that works for them, you plug it into your VCR between your ears, it doesn't work. So you have to what? You have to find your own. And you allow yourself then to enter in. You allow the circuitry to begin. You become familiar with yourself as you do anything else. You begin to learn about yourself. You begin to become comfortable with yourself in the meditation. And then everything starts to seek itself. And the circuitry starts to flow. And you have your own shadow. You have your own divine self. And they start to interact with one another. But it's yours and it's personal. And it doesn't belong to anybody else. And what you're doing will not work for anybody else. Never will it work for anybody else. See, the difference that you have. And, and, and this is the amazing thing. You have people like Jung, you have people like Sigmund Freud, you have, I don't know who are the contemporary psychologists and psychoanalysts of today, but you have brilliant people who are trying to explain the, the, the complexities of the human mind, and then you have religion which pictures all of this as an intelligent, powerful person deliberately hiding in the bushes to do you in and to cause you to lose your salvation. And you know what? The majority of people actually believe it. There is some guy named Satan who is lurking in the bushes, hiding behind the trees, hiding behind poles, ready to stick you into all of these kind of things, and actually the word is nothing but a symbolism of these energy fields that run through the human mind, the human brain. How can, how can intelligent people, and you know most of the people that actually believe this, you know the people that teach this stuff are all college graduates. What in God's name did they learn? Where did they go? But they come out of college and teach this to people, many people who've never been to school at all. And believe it, there is a devil, there is a Satan. This is real, this is true. Forget about it. If you have a psychoanalyst or a psychologist tells you how the human mind works and what all of this stuff is, and then all of this demonic stuff, suddenly you can take care of this demonic stuff by using a drug. You can go to the doctor, and the doctor can give you a particular drug, and he can cause that to come down like this, or that to go up like this. And then maybe it's going up and down until he gets it measured and all of a sudden he gets you leveled off and then voila, you're normal. What happened to the devil? Where'd he go? Where'd Satan go? He was done in by some kind of uh, Avatron or Mellotron or whatever these pills are and uh, off you go. It's just like a venereal disease. It's from the devil until you find out that you got penicillin. Where'd the devil go? It wasn't too long ago. I remember as a kid, we used to see people with muscular dystrophy walking down the street. We walked to the other side of the street because we thought we were, they were possessed of some kind of devil. Why? Because we went to church. And church is ignorant. Religion is ignorant. And it doesn't understand science. It doesn't understand the human mind. It only understands the stuff which it misinterprets. And so they must be demon-possessed. These people that you read about in the Bible, they talk about people frothing at the mouth or people that are having some kind of seizures. But in those days, they were considered demon-possessed. It's really sad. But that's not what evil is. Evil is not some guy called the devil or Satan. Evil is not that at all. Evil is imbalance. Evil is ignorance. Evil is accident. And so the important thing, as I would hope that you would come here, if nothing else, maybe you don't understand all of this thing, but if nothing else, the important thing is that you break free of the superstition of devils and demons that are taught by ignorant people that should know better, and in most cases do know better. And most of these people that teach this ridiculous thing of devils, devils and demons and all of this stuff, do it to make a buck. And they don't dare part with the organization who teaches this stuff because their social security and their retirement depends on it. So they'll teach it to you forever until they retire. And they know doggone well that it's not true. And you know it's not true, true, true either, but you don't question them because you're not allowed to. So on and on and on it goes. And what is Jehoshua the Christ said in John 8, 32? If you get inside of yourself and do what he says and practice the single eye, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's the most important thing in the world to be set free. See, it's a lot easier. The Buddhist monk, he can retire to his temple. It's great that, you know, we could put it up here, you know, quit our jobs, <laughs> and, and you go in the temple and you say all day, meditating. See? And that's great, I guess. But I got to go to work. Tomorrow, I got to go to work. A lot of you have to go to work. And, and as soon as you do, you get involved and you are surrounded and you are totally consumed in the shadow. 
you can actually tell by the shadow. There's people who are sitting home tonight and, and they're playing music or watching something or they're playing country music or they're at a movie and they're totally in a divine realm of some type of meditative state. They'll get up tomorrow morning and they'll be going through the Lincoln Tunnel to get to New York and the shadows will be all over the place. Bedlam, berserk, bedlam. Because that's the way we have to live. And that's great! The problem is we have been misinformed on how to deal with all of these things and how, how do we live. And let me tell you something. Every human being, from pope to pauper, from drug addict to divine, every person harbors an inner sore, a private shadow of anger, a private shadow of lust, a private shadow of pain. It's in every human being. And the terrible part of this are pompous preachers and religious people who make you think that they've found a way out of it and you have got to find your way out of it. And the truth is they found a way out of nothing. We're just going through the OJ symptoms thing, book ball, jumping over things and everything, as everything in the world. How could anything like this happen? The shadow. It's, it's just every human being is subjected to this at any time. It makes no difference. And when you look at a preacher, you look at a priest, you look at an evangelist, you're seeing what you're supposed to see. But you're not seeing what goes on when he opens his door. Or you're not seeing when he gets in his car and drives off to some other town and does his thing. You'll never see it. But I can tell you something, guaranteed you, he drives off to some other town and does his thing. Celibacy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> And then, you know, as we wrap this up, let's think of something. That you have a dark side, which is a microcosm. I have a dark side, which is a microcosm. What goes on in here? But it is a microcosm of that which is the macrocosm of the system. The system's dark side doesn't punch against the wall. It drops bombs on people. It tortures people. I mean, they're... There are governments in the world and extremely dark and have done terrible things and they're doing them on television today to people. During our, our childhood, previous lives or whatever you want to say, the dark side grew. I mean, it's just flowers. Maybe it's weeds if you want to call it, but nonetheless, it's part of us. But you know, let me show you something. If the lights go out, and you're in a dark room, what's the first thing, and I don't mean going to sleep, what's the first thing you do? You look to find light. And you know what? You would have never had to look to find that light unless the light went out. Think of that. The reason that many of you sit here and listen to me and, and on the tapes and so forth is because inside of you there has crept a darkness and you're looking for a light. Otherwise, there would be no reason for you to be here. Without darkness, nobody seeks to find the light. That's why it's so critically important. You see, if everybody on the earth was able to get rid of, of all of, of, of their, their dark side, they'd be very content, and they would miss it all. They would miss everything, because they would miss that thing, that entity that we call God. See it here. People that get in trouble, they get very sick, whatever they come, they need meditation. As soon as the problem goes away, they do too. Because they don't need the light anymore. So they're gone. The light then suddenly becomes that which they have at home or that which is going well. Everything's going okay. We get people, oh, I haven't been down in a long time, but everything is going fine. That's why you haven't been down. Because everything's going fine. And so what is necessary? God has to create evil in their lives. God has to create evil in their lives to force them to look for light. Carl Jung put it uh, in a beautiful, beautiful way. He said, move deeper and deeper towards the source. But understand something. If you start to grow bored and you start to stall along the way, darkness will stick you. It's a very important part of your life and my life to save us. You know what it took for me to try to realize that I had to subdue my anger in speaking 
was smashing my hand down on this thing and getting five stitches in it. That's darkness. But it taught me a tremendous lesson. And it's not just a lesson of not slamming the hand down. It's a lesson of realizing that how am I going to convey peace by being angry. I still get angry. And when, I, when, I, when I see the things that go on, and I read the Bible, and I see these church and preachers and all of this stuff and prancing around and saying, oh, where all this violence and all this, and they're the purveyors of it, and I see that it originated in the Bible and it originated. So that gets me very mad and very angry because I, 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 all over the television, people want to deal with the violence. How do we get rid of this violence? But nobody ever turns and looks straight in the eye of these religious people and say, you're responsible for it. I do. They're responsible for it. They are responsible for it. And Carl Jung says that both darkness and light are illusions because underneath them both is a being, a bliss, a consciousness. And you've got to understand that and chart your course and move upward. So there'll always be that. There'll always be the darkness. There'll always be the negative aspects of your life. And they are there to prompt you to continue to look for that which is the light side, to look for the bright side. I, if, you want a, if you want an example of one who lived in darkness with light consistently, it's Jehoshua the Christ. His whole life was portrayed as darkness and light, one against the other. Bill? Yes. Yeah, you have to. Would you come up for me? I don't you? understand what be therefore perfect even as your father in heaven. I don't understand what's perfection then. Is it integrating the two? Okay. Yeah. Let, let's take a look at what perfection is. And that's, it's a good question. What is perfection? Okay, let's take here. Uh, what we have to do is get this as white or bright and full of light as we can get this, okay? And say this is a human being, and say this is the carnal mind or the left hemisphere, which is the 10%, and if we want, we'll call that the darkness. And this is the right hemisphere, which is light. Okay. Now, I am dwelling here constantly. This is the place of perfection. Perfection. Why is it perfection? Because nothing can penetrate. Nothing from here, nothing from here, nothing from here, nothing from here. Nothing can penetrate. It stays absolutely perfect, unstained, unsoiled by anything whatsoever. Okay. But I live here. I cannot live there. Why? Because I am a live, functioning, physical, flesh and blood person. Okay? But when I am instructed to be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is, in perfect, is perfect, I realize that heaven is within me. This is heaven. This is Father, if you would, the mind. So I have to be perfect as the Father is perfect, and the Father is perfect because it dwells in the place of perfection within me at the right hemisphere. So I, I struggle with myself not to move in there, but to move out of here. And so what I do, I physically, willingly suppress the thought patterns in my meditation. And when I do that, a door opens here, there is an opening, and then a flow between that which is, just like you said, light and darkness flow together. And then I start to learn, I start to understand, I start to realize, I start to receive instruction, I start to receive impulses. And then as my meditation comes to an end, the door of the temple closes and I am here again. But I have learned, I have picked up understanding, I have picked up enlightenment, and then I can use this in my everyday thing to bring this help and whatever it is that comes from the Father or comes from the place of perfection to do for others. And so there is an interaction. I am living in imperfection. I am living in darkness. Darkness is two things. Darkness is good and evil. Sometimes it's good. Oh, I visited somebody at the hospital. Sometimes it's evil. I ran over an old lady on the way to the hospital. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't go too good. So in order for me then to realize what life is, my instruction has to come from here, the place of perfection. So therefore, to be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect, I must enter the closet, close the door on all the thoughts of the mind. There is a definite interaction between, lightness, between light and darkness, and that's what we're saying, and there's a definite interaction between perfection. But perfection is a one-way thing. It's like a, a river that flows one direction. Nothing can go this way. It's like a one-way street. Nothing can go that way and go into perfection. Perfection only comes this way and comes out into us. 
And that's what it is. Okay, and, and that's why Jesus says, cast your net to the right side. That's why it says, sit at the right hand of the Father. That's why the wise men came from the east and the stars in the east and all of this stuff. It has to do with perfection comes when all of this is closed out. There is no more of it. And, 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 and understand something now. This only happens during a period of time when you're in meditation. Other than that, it doesn't happen. You know, if I get to meditate on a Tuesday night for 40 minutes or whatever it is, I've got 40 minutes... Out of that 40 minutes, I'm probably going to get three in perfection. Three minutes in perfection. But the wonderful thing is realizing I only need three seconds. Three minutes is great. Because as I am opening the door, or as the door is opening to allow me to receive from perfection, this thing is still going on. You see? And so I'll get into a beautiful pattern here of, of meditation in which I get into perfection, and after maybe 40 seconds of that particular segment of my struggle with light and darkness, after that particular thing happens, I am again bombarded with the things that come from the left side of imperfection. So it's, 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 it's be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. For what reason? So that in your imperfection you can prosper. In your imperfection you can be able to help others. In your imperfection you can be able to overcome some of the things that otherwise can either make you sick or can cause you great inconvenience or whatever. How do you live your life better? By taking instruction from this side. And so that's, you know, it's a very good question, but you can only be perfect when you use that perfection during that period of time of meditation. Because when you're back here, you're definitely imperfect. Yes, sir. Would you, would you, uh, let me see if I, can we get, yeah, if you could come up here because uh, people uh, can't hear. Remind me, uh, when uh, some, I heard it mentioned, uh, what's the difference between meditation and uh, prayer? Mm. And, uh, I was told that uh, prayer is when you talk to God and meditation is when God talks to you. Okay, so I have no problem with that. No, it's, I have no problem with that at all except that uh, who am I talking to? If I'm talking to God, basically I'm talking to myself. And I do that all the time anyhow. Yeah, you know? yeah. but I mean I, I, am, I am constantly in a conversation with myself and basically prayer is talking to yourself because who else is going to hear this? Where, you know, you, know, you know, there's nobody else in here. If you can come into this room, in, in the solitude of this room, and there's nobody else here, and the room can be black as pitch, and you can sit here and talk to God. And that's fine, as long as you realize that you're communicating with your own mind. And that's what Jehoshua the Christ tried to get through to us. It's inside of you. So if you want to pray, you want to start instructing your mind. And the best prayer that you can ever utter is, I am seeking the mind of Christ. Okay? And, and to, you know, to take a, a group of people who have lived on this planet and almost brought it to absolute destruction and say that we're going to tell God. And what do you do with prayer? For the most part, you tell God what to do. So yes. It's a path towards more and more awareness or enlightenment, but it's not a state of being in itself to, right now. Because I think that's what the confusion is with the Bible, is people think they have to be perfect now. Well, you, but, 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 you know, but I, I think that the important thing to understand is that the perfection is a temporary thing because as long, if you were created to be darkness on this side and light on this side, that's imperfection. That's fine. That's the way you're created. Jehoshua the Christ is saying, be perfect, meaning go into the place of perfection, okay. knowing full temporary. well that you've got to come back out to the imperfection. I mean, uh, you know, he had a perfection. But then he had an imperfection. He got ticked off and went into the temple and kicked everybody out, threw stuff out. Guys are trying to make a buck. He's throwing the stuff out and kicking pigeons out and all this kind of stuff. It didn't happen. I mean, it doesn't mean that at all. But I'm saying the story portrays that. I mean, you know, he's perfect. You know, God, I'll accept your will. And then, of course, in the thing when he's going to get killed, he says, hey, yeah, how about, you know, letting somebody else hand? <coughs> no, I don't want this. Well, that didn't happen either, but it's simply a story of imperfection. How do I know it didn't happen? Because he was the only one there. Nobody else heard him. The other guys were asleep. I mean, you know, who heard this? So somebody makes the story up, but the story is given to convey you. So the point about perfection, and then we'll just drop it with this, be perfect means enter into a position of meditation where you experience perfection. And then, yes, uh, you have to, you know, it's important. But, but, like, if you get into, like, religion and Christianity, they present your dark side or your false self 
as being perfect because they, you become like a, a phony self. Mm -hmm. Like I can't think bad thoughts, mm -hmm. and that's the way they perceive perfection. Yeah. Well, that, that right? goes against what Carl Jung says yeah. about you're just yeah. suppressing it. You're not yeah. dealing with right, it Right, but at that's all. what they do yeah. to you. That's right. And then they think that I'm this person who's above everybody else, and and that's where they come well, from. Well, yeah, but I think, I think that life itself, you can't do that. Life itself. No, you can't. No, but but what that's, what you're, that's what people are taught. So yeah. then when they get into religion and into the traditionalness of it, they, they're, there's totally, they're on the, they think they're on the light side, but they're really on the dark side because they're really suppressing all of these thoughts that come up in their head. And so they become then really at odds with themselves. Okay, but the point that I was going to bring out, we can name three of them right off the top of the bat. And we will because it's public thing. I'm not talking about anything. But we have three people who instruct people on living in perfection, living in the light, and being the way they are and so forth and so on. And we can name them. Jimmy Swaggart is one. Uh -huh. um, thank you. Jimmy Swaggart is one. Uh, uh, Robert Tilton is another one. Yeah. Uh, Jim Baker is another one. Yeah. And these were guys who were, you know, Bible. They were at the church mm -hmm. and they were all singing Amazing Grace and doing all of these things and epitomized spiritual perfection. Mm -hmm. But when the cover was removed, we found out mm -hmm. that it was anything bad. It was a septic tank full of crap. It yeah. really was. Well, but well. see, when people are in that and they look <coughs> to these supposedly role models yeah. and they're being told that this is what you have to do and this is what you have to think and that you you have to be this this person who's just like beautiful and you can't live up to that that's right then people then come down on themselves more i mean we were exposed to it that's enough right. that as soon as you walked into church like you couldn't confess anything you couldn't have, even have a headache that's right. I, and we would say we have a headache, and they'd say, yeah. no, you don't have a headache, yeah. you know, confess yeah. something. But so it's really the, the way they're indoctrinated and brainwashed, uh -huh. okay? And then you find out, I really can't exist in this world, so where am I? I'm a bad person then, because but, I'm yeah, different than they right. are. That's right. Mm -hmm. But so I, the I guilt comes. I think where that comes from, and I think the, the problem with it, is that these churches and these religious groups frown upon uh, like psychologists, uh -huh. psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, uh, scientific people who deal with the workings of the mind mm -hmm. and pretend that, that everything is going. We have seen situations, and mm -hmm. I can tell you of situations where in a, uh, one of these types of churches they had one of these very emotional evangelistic uh, healing services and uh, this young fellow went out and he had this medicine that he used, I think Lithium. it was for, a, what was mm -hmm. it for? A Manic depressive. Manic depressive mm -hmm. and he poured him down the toilet because mm -hmm. he was saved and healed mm -hmm. and he wound up in a hospital in a very, very critical manic. condition. Yeah. Um, so, you know, anybody, to me, yeah, the person they, was saved and healed because he had the medicine. Yeah, but I mean. see, then they said to him afterwards, you didn't have enough faith. Yeah. 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 Okay? Yeah. He threw his pills in the ocean. Yeah. Okay? And then he was told, well, you weren't healed. You were healed momentarily, but you weren't healed permanently because you didn't have enough faith. Yeah, yeah. So then he went on a guilt yeah. trip. Yeah. So it's a control. Yeah. It's a total control. That's right. And and see what you're doing is is you're educating people that everybody has a dark side. Integrate it. Okay? Allow yourself to be free. Allow yourself to see that you have this, but you also have a light side. It, and I, don't you think though it's very important especially as those of us who work in this field to encourage people that feel that they that they need a doctor to see a doctor, yeah. they need to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Very, very, yeah. it's important. My yeah. God, it, the creative powers of the universe have given these people skills to help. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's like the guy that says, uh, oh, well, where was God? Well, God has given these skillful people to help you, has provided mm -hmm. these uh, wonders that they've devised of medicine to help you, and they're there. We'll use it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the worst thing that really just really ticked me off so bad mm -hmm. as people in religion who because they used medicine or had that they were somehow uh, you know they against God or whatever. You well know? I just love it that and this is a story it might offend some people but remember you had to use the bathroom that the evangelist where he was staying in the apartment and he had medicine he's out there <laughs> preaching every single yeah. night to you know. I, I gotta tell this. Go I gotta, ahead, you tell <laughs> <it>. <laughs> this guy was healing everybody. 
<laughs> All right, this was great. I'm not going to say who, because this was, but this was an evangelist, and he was packing them in mm -hmm. every night of the week. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were lined up, and they would glasses. come down, throw away your eyeglasses, throw away your crutches. Mm -hmm. So I had to use the John and the all the Johns. Were, so somebody said to me, well, why don't you go in there with the evangelist? So, so I went in there, and there he had on top of his briefcase a jar of salve for jock itch. <laughs> I said, how come he couldn't heal jock itch? <laughs> but people can heal their eyes. Yeah, lay your hands on it, bro. <laughs> and <it'll go> <laughs> but I think, see, what you're teaching here is, <laughs> is to be able to accept yourself and right. like yourself and, and just learn how to integrate it and just say, okay, this is this side, but I also have this side. And not be at odds with yourself and not think you're the only one in the world that has these thoughts or has I, these that's ideas. That's what's great about the people that come here. We know we mm. all have mm -hmm. whacked out sides and mm -hmm. good sides. Mm -hmm. And it's enjoyable. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's share some weird stories about ourselves. That's great. Mm -hmm. Some of you guys are pretty crazy. <laughs> Especially, <laughs> Especially you. Especially me. Okay. It was good. Anybody else have anything that you want to uh, say? Or? Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, it was good, and uh, you know, I, I, I love to be able to sometimes bring in, when we get into spiritual things, to bring in some of the works and comments of a, of a person like Carl Jung from a pretty scientific basis, you know, and that, that, that to me is, uh, is so important, because then we realize that God, which we call God, is really a cosmic God, a God of science, and I, I am convinced that God exists and is provable, you know, and if you can't prove it, just forget about it. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, get away from faith. Faith is just something you need when you're not sure. But you have to be sure of God. And you can be when you start to understand the scientific principles of the human mind and the human body. That's enough of that. Thank you very much. We'll see you. And... Uh... <laughs>